Hello everyone, in this penultimate Wednesday video for 2023, the fine folks over on Patreon asked me to discuss five naval myths that they had heard. Of course, I'm not psychic yet, so I don't know what they've heard. So I asked them, okay, well, you want me to discuss five naval myths? What five naval myths do you want me to talk about? And of course, you know, whichever one's got the most uh, agreement, they're the ones we're going to discuss today. So, this will contain some myths you might be familiar with. It might contain some myths you've never heard of before. And some of the results might surprise you. Some of the conclusions as well. Because after all, in some cases, conclusions are somewhat subjective. Because there is a given body of evidence. But how people interpret that evidence can, of course, vary. So, let's start off with... Kamikazes, a cheerful subject. So the claim made uh, by some people, which is what they want me to respond to, is Kamikazes were a senseless, insane tactic. Now, this is going to be a rather interesting one, because, of course, what the Kamikazes achieved is a matter of record. And exactly how effective that was in a grand strategic term, obviously not very, because it didn't stop the Japanese from losing the war and it didn't really manifestly slow the Allies down too much, although individual incidents could be very, very destructive, both in terms of ships damaged or destroyed and in terms of lives lost. But speaking from a purely rational perspective, so without you know the emotions of the fact that these are suicide attacks, going on, let's have a look at whether they are actually completely senseless and insane in and of themselves, outside of the broader strategic picture, although we will come back to that a little bit later. Now, of course, most of the time, if you're going to come up with an extreme solution, that usually means you're facing an extreme problem. And the Japanese were facing an extreme problem. That was the increasing effectiveness of Allied, obviously primarily in the Pacific Theater, American anti-aircraft firepower and fighter control and direction in sheer numbers. Essentially, they were trying to get, deliver weaponry in the form of bombs and torpedoes to American ships to stop the American advance, and their success rate just wasn't high enough. Aircraft were getting shot down, and the few aircraft that did make it into weapon release range weren't hitting all that much because, of course, we're talking an era of unguided weaponry. Once you release that bomb or you release that torpedo, it's hopefully going to go in the direction that it was aimed in. But if your aim is off or the enemy evades, the weapon's going to not hit. And quite often, the pilot who just released that bomb or torpedo from that dive bomber or torpedo bomber might still not be coming back because pulling out from that attack run, they're still within range of the anti-aircraft firepower. They might still get shot down that way. And even if they do manage to evade the anti-aircraft curtains, then they might get picked up by a Wildcat or a Hellcat or a Corsair or something like that on their way back. So essentially, you can split the problem into three sections. The fact that not many aircraft are getting through in the first place to release their weapons the fact that of the released weapons, not many are hitting. And then finally, of the aircraft that do manage to release their weapons, not many of those are actually coming back to try again. Of course, we know towards the end of the war, various nations were working on guided weapon systems to try and mitigate just the miss rate, if nothing else. So the Germans had Fritz X and HS-293, the Americans had bat bombs, the Germans also had acoustic homing torpedoes, and so on and so forth. But for the Japanese, they faced two problems. One, they didn't have those kinds of guidance systems developed in an operation. And even if they had, you know, hand wave magic away, the problem, they've still got to produce them in large enough numbers, which is another problem in and of itself. And of course, a bunch of those systems in and of themselves also have weaknesses that are tied back to the original problem that the Japanese are facing. When you look at the German attempts, for example, German guided anti-shipping weapons like Fritz X and HS-293 in part were countered by jamming, but in part were also countered just by shooting down the launching aircraft because you've only moved the problem of your aircraft being shot down somewhat further back. And now you have to use a bigger and less 
maneuverable launching aircraft and it's got to stay at least in the case of some of the systems moving in a relatively straight steady course which means that if you have let's say i don't know hundreds of fighters available to you on combat air patrol you're still gonna gonna get shot down a large aircraft contains multiple crew so your losses are actually higher per sortie and if the aircraft gets shot down before the guided weapon hits then the weapon is going to lose guidance and probably not hit so for various reasons that kind of guidance system wasn't available of course you have autonomous guidance systems like the bat bomb that we said the americans would later use and acoustic homing torpedoes but again you need a relatively large launch platform for something like a bat or you know a submarine to get in range to launch an acoustic homing torpedo and that still has the problem of being shot down just not quite as much of a problem as one you have to continue to have to guide in and all of this of course assumes that the japanese had the guidance technology in the first place which as we just mentioned they didn't however there was one guidance system which was to a certain extent readily available and actually has a computing power far in excess of anything else that could be come up with at the time that's the human brain obviously within a human body a human pilot in this case when we talk about aircraft although they would also try this with manned torpedoes with the kaiten they can make course corrections they're much better able to distinguish between a decoy system or a bunch of land and an actual target ship that you're going after and of course the aircraft that you would be putting the pilots in require relatively minimal adaptation in fact none in a lot of cases because aircraft are already designed to accommodate human pilots of course there would later be purpose-built suicide aircraft but they're essentially just aircraft that you're really not planning on getting back in any way shape or form whereas adapted kamikaze aircraft tend to have you know things like landing gear which help on takeoff but in theory you'll never need again because you're not planning on coming back now this might seem counterintuitive to the last problem the fact that not many pilots who release their weapons are returning because of course now no pilots who reach the target area are going to be returning but you have to look at it in context of all three problems the first problem aircraft are getting shot down before they get to weapons release range that is somewhat mitigated by the use of kamikaze tactics because for example a torpedo bomber has to fly relatively low and slow to drop its torpedo a kamikaze which is aiming to come in at pretty high speed doesn't have to do that which means that its time in the danger zone of enemy fighter and flak coverage is significantly minimized so in theory if you took a squadron of japanese torpedo bombers and you said right you are going to go in and drop your torpedoes and this second identical squadron is going to go in as a kamikaze more of your kamikazes will reach the target ship because they're going to fly through that danger zone of fighters and flak faster and even when it comes to things like dive bombers and fighters that might be converted for this purpose when you're still concerned about making it back you have to think about approach vectors uh, you have to think about exit vectors you know there's no point in making a dive bombing run if you're going to pull up straight into a curtain of flak or straight into a bunch of wait waiting fighters and the approaches that we just mentioned those could be quite important as well because if you are a dive bomber coming in straight down on a ship that's coming towards you gives you the full length of the ship to try and hit coming in perpendicular to the ship well it's a much narrower target to hit and of course the ship is moving across your field of view which means you're going to have to be making essentially a deflection bombing drop which is considerably harder to work out especially when under fire whereas with the best one in the world if you're a kamikaze assuming you don't dive too quickly and your controls lock up you just have to point at the target and make the last few last minute course corrections so kamikazes mitigate the first problem to a certain extent more of your pilots are going to make it through to the target rather than with your conventional approach and then you have the second problem that being the misses once you get to weapons release range well of course in this case you are the weapon there is no release range because you're going straight into the side of a ship or onto the deck or whatever and in theory 
a kamikaze will mitigate this portion of the problem as well. Because as we mentioned earlier, if you drop a bomb or a torpedo that is now going on a specific path, the enemy can evade or your aim might be off and there's nothing you can do to correct it once you've released that weapon. Whereas as a kamikaze, you can continuously make course corrections right up to the last moment. And that means if you made a mistake on your initial attack run, again, assuming you don't do something like dive so quickly that your controls lock up, which was a problem with some kamikazes, there is a much higher percentage chance of you hitting. Now, of course, that last approach is mitigated somewhat by the fact that you're in an aircraft. That aircraft can still be shot down and spin out of control, whereas instances of shooting a torpedo out of the water or detonating a bomb mid-fall are vanishingly rare. But the counter to that counter is, of course, the fact that when you're on that very, very final approach, assuming you've got a half-decent approach line worked out already, shooting down your aircraft in and of itself, i.e. inflicting fatal damage that the aircraft is never going to fly again, may not actually change things all that much. If you were on the correct approach line and someone stitches a bunch of 20 millimeter or can fire into your engine and the engine catches fire, doesn't really make much odds because it just means you're already on fire when you hit the target. Once your aircraft is on final approach, pretty much the only way to deflect that kamikaze aircraft from hitting the target is to physically blow off enough of the aircraft that it either disintegrates into a bunch of fragments, which may still hit, but will have dramatically less effect than the whole aircraft and whatever weapons payload it carried, or more ideally to tear off enough of some extremity, usually a wing, that the aircraft tumbles out of control, dramatically changing its aerodynamics and thus changing course in a way that's irrevocable for the pilot, and thus the kamikaze misses. 20mm Orlikon fire, as it turns out, wasn't actually that good at doing this, which is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why in the latter part of the war, the 20mm Orlikon, although it had, had done stalwart service for the beginning and middle parts of World War II, was rather rapidly being supplanted by the 40mm Bofors, and even the 40mm Bofors was looking at being supplanted by things like the automatic 3-inch, simply because that gave you more range to engage a kamikaze, because of course even if you did blow off a wingtip, if you do that 100 meters away, it might not change course enough to miss your ship. If you do it half a mile away, it probably will change course enough to miss your ship. And of course once you get into the heavier shells like the 40mm or the 3 inch, the chances of just physically tearing bits off of an aircraft with each hit go up rather dramatically. This is why in the latter stages of the Pacific War, for example, the 40mm pom-pom actually had a bit of a resurgence in popularity, not necessarily because it had superior ballistics to the 40mm Bofors, it didn't, but with those long belts of ammunition and the fact that most pom-poms came in quad or octuple form, you could just point a pom-pom at an incoming kamikaze and hose it down to the extent you essentially turned it into flying confetti, which was something that single and twin 40mm Bofors struggled with, and even the quadruple Bofors installations weren't necessarily always quite as good because of that unlimited, essentially for the engagement, rate of fire that the pom-pom could manage, compared to the rather desperate hand reloading that would be going on on Bofors at that point. But in any case, at least on paper, the use of kamikazes mitigates those first two issues. More of your aircraft are going to get to the proximity of the enemy fleet, and of those aircraft, more of them are going to hit. That, again, on paper, means that you don't need as many aircraft, so your overall losses compared to if you factor in that third issue of aircraft that have released their weapons getting shot down, your losses might actually decrease overall because you might be achieving better results with the expenditure of fewer pilots, or you could achieve even better results by losing roughly the same number of pilots, or if your losses in various attacks are so catastrophic that you're you know, running 90, 95, 100% loss rates anyway, you can throw just as many aircraft and pilots at the problem and, again on paper, have significantly better results. Now there are a few technical details that both improve and reduce your overall chances. You have the fact that 
if you're putting the aircraft in as well as the whatever bombs or torpedoes you happen to be carrying, that means there's additional mass, there's additional force of impact, and of course the aircraft's going to be carrying fuel and in and of itself is going to turn into shrapnel. So objectively the fire and the shrapnel will do more immediate damage than just the weapon itself. Conversely, armor-piercing bombs, which are what you want to use to get deep inside a ship to do the most damage, do require moving at quite a high speed. There's a reason why dive bombers can't dive too low, because if they release too low, the bomb won't be able to accelerate under gravity f fast enough to actually have enough kinetic energy to punch through. So especially if you're coming in at an angle, because most kamikazes aren't going to come in at 80, 90 degrees, you may not be coming in fast enough for an armor-piercing bomb board to actually deliver an armor-piercing effect to the extent that you need. Of course, that might not mean the ship is sunk, but it will probably still result in a lot of damage. It depends what your target is. Therefore, kamikazes are going to be less effective against really heavily armored targets on a per-impact basis, so battleships, for example, but if you're going after troop transports, escort carriers, or American-style fleet carriers where the hangar is essentially unprotected as far as an incoming kamikaze is concerned and tends to be full of fuel and armed aircraft and things like that, then in against those targets, a kamikaze can actually be very effective. The other thing, of course, with kamikaze pilots is that you don't strictly need them to be quite as well trained, which means that if you're suffering a skilled pilot shortage like the Japanese were, well, you can tap new resources, obviously being very cold at this point, in order to get those kamikaze aircraft to their targets, because a fully skilled pilot, well, apart from anything, they have to know how to land. You probably have to teach a kamikaze pilot that as well, just to teach them how to fly in the first place. But... You don't need to really teach a kamikaze pilot how to do complex dogfighting, how to do low and slow torpedo drops, how to calculate the drop angle for a dive bomb, or even how to do particularly complicated evasive maneuvers. You just have to teach them how to get the aircraft off the ground, keep it in the air long enough to get to the target, maybe do some basic evasion work so you're not entirely a predictable target for fighters and for anti-aircraft fire and that's really about it because after that the kamikaze pilot doesn't need to know how to fly anymore so on paper the idea of using volunteer pilots to fly their aircraft and payloads straight into enemy ships is not senseless or insane it actually makes a fair degree of sense purely from an objective level of course on the grander strategic level how many additional hits you're going to get and what effect that's going to have on an enemy like you know the allied fleet in the latter stages of world war ii that makes it strategically a bit more senseless and insane because whether you hit and sank five ships or 50 ships that's not going to stop a navy that's coming at you with hundreds and even thousands of ships, and certainly not when you've got the two largest navies on the planet coming after you at the same time. Now, before we move on to slightly less depressing territory, there is actually, interestingly, again, if you want to be completely cold and objective about this, one final colliery about this, which is that kamikazes are obviously a tactic of desperation, but by the time you get to a point where you're thinking about using kamikazes, you're probably in a situation where kamikazes are not going to ultimately solve your problem. Because if your aircraft are getting shot down in such numbers that you can't get much, if anything, in the way of hits on the enemy already, increasing that hit percentage somewhat probably isn't going to help you. And as it turns out with the Japanese, it didn't. Strangely enough, and this is where things get really chilling, where kamikazes, in, at least in the World War II Pacific campaign context, make the most sense is in 1942. Because in 1942, the state of anti-aircraft defences was considerably less effective than it would be a year or two down the line. There were much fewer anti-aircraft guns on various ships, radar 
guidance directly for the anti-aircraft guns was only really just about becoming a thing. There wasn't the VT fuse and there weren't as many ships and there weren't as many fighters in the air. So more aircraft were getting through to launch distance. And you see that in the fact that, you know, Hornet, Yorktown, etc., etc., are all hit and sunk by more conventional methods. But of course, by the end of 1942, when you look at some of the battles around Guadalcanal, the Japanese pilot court is already suffering quite a bit of attrition and as we know they didn't manage to sink enough ships to deter the US or to really manifestly slow down US war efforts that much. There was a bit obviously but not hugely. Whereas if you had kamikazes implemented in 1942, Coral Sea, Midway, Santa Cruz Islands, Eastern Solomons etc. well a fairly high number of your aircraft are going to make it to the target. Your chances of fighter interception in some of those battles are fairly low and in some cases actually non-existent. The anti-aircraft guns, as we said, probably not going to take too many of you down, especially in the earlier stages. And at that point, if you think about how many bombs and how many torpedoes were dropped and dodged or just missed various US ships, if you change that to the accuracy levels of kamikazes, especially, in, as we said, relatively speaking, unopposed environments, they could have done a lot more damage to the US fleet then. And obviously, whilst that doesn't change anything about the Essex swarm, because no amount of kamikazes in 1942 can sink an Essex that's still under construction in the continental United States, they might have been able to do either enough damage or sink enough ships to the existing US fleet, that's, you know, ships like Saratoga and Enterprise, etc., etc., that they might have actually bought themselves a reasonable amount of time. Because if over the course of Coral Sea and Midway, a relatively small number of Japanese aircraft have badly damaged or destroyed a bunch of American carriers, well, then realistically, you're going to have if Enterprise is down, for example, and maybe Hornet as well, then you're going to have Saratoga and Wasp available for Guadalcanal. Are the Americans going to risk the Guadalcanal campaign with just Saratoga and Wasp available? Maybe. But if the first battle of Guadalcanal that involves aircraft carriers sees Saratoga and Wasp, again, badly damaged or taken out, most likely taken out in the case of Wasp, by further kamikaze strikes, well, now the US is completely out of fleet carriers with the exception of Ranger, and, well, Ranger survival prospects against a active kamikaze threat in late 1942 are not particularly high. So, weirdly enough, kamikazes would have made more sense to use at the time period where nobody in their right mind was actually going to think about using them. But that's the difference between looking at things from a purely objective standpoint versus, you know, an actual human standpoint. So were kamikazes senseless and insane? On paper? Actually, no. They they do make a disturbing amount of sense. On the grander strategic level, well, any Japanese resistance past a certain point is technically just throwing away lives pointlessly because there was no real chance of them winning after that point. Obviously, where you draw that line is down to you. Next up, a little bit of a two for one. Were battleships obsolete on December the 8th, 1941? That being obviously the day after Pearl Harbor. And somewhat tied into that, the assertion that the US Navy only fully committed to aircraft carriers after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So dealing with the second one first, did the US Navy only really fully commit to an aircraft carrier based fleet or a fleet with a lot of aircraft carriers in it? after December 7th, 1941. Now, on a very surface level, this idea might seem to have a certain amount of appeal, because obviously after December 7th, 1941, the US was short by quite a few battleships, and the independences, most if not all of the escort carriers, and the Essexes all appear afterwards. So, just based on that very high level sort of skim of knowledge, it might be tempting to conclude that, oh, well, yeah, the, the US Navy only went for aircraft carriers after Pearl Harbor. However, scratching the surface a little bit, 
and you find out that that's actually not true in the slightest. If you look at 1940-41, obviously because most of 1941 is before December 7th, you'll see that the US has authorized a number of ships. The first two Iowa class, Iowa and New Jersey, were already ordered in 1939, but they're laid down in 1940. And Missouri, Wisconsin, of course, the other two that would be completed, and Illinois and Kentucky, the two that wouldn't be completed, they were all ordered in 1940. Missouri and Wisconsin would be laid down in 1941. Illinois and Kentucky would be laid down later in 1942, so post Pearl Harbor. But they've also got to look at the Montana class. They're all also authorized in 1940. So if we just go by authorized-ordered dates, you're looking at the five Montanas and the last four Iowas, so nine battleships. So that sounds like the US is aiming for a fairly battleship-heavy navy. Of course, you've got the other two Iowas if you want to throw them in. But when you stop to consider things a little bit further, look at the carriers. A good chunk of the first wave of the Bogue class escort carriers and you know the few other escort carriers that were built before the Bogues, which are the first big run of escort carriers, they're also all ordered and in some cases laid down prior to Pearl Harbor. The Independence class, now whilst they are actually a post-Pearl Harbor invention, the fight to actually get something like them sorted out had started long before Pearl Harbor, as we recently saw at the time of the release of this video with the five minute guide to the independence class. So that was already under consideration. And then when you look at the Essex class themselves, the big fleet carriers, well, what had been ordered before Pearl Harbor? Essex? Bonham Richard, Intrepid, Kearsarge, Franklin, Hancock, Randolph, Cabo, Bunker Hill, Oriskany, Ticonderoga. You know, that's quite a number of Essex class. Now, of course, some of those names would be either reused in later ships or not used at all because of aircraft carrier losses during the war. So originally, Bonham Richard was supposed to be CV-10. She was renamed to Yorktown. Kearsarge was supposed to be CB-12. She was renamed to Hornet. Hancock was supposed to be CB-14. She was renamed to Ticonderoga. Cabo, CB-16, was renamed to Lexington. Oriskany, was CB-18, was renamed to Wasp. And CB-19, which was supposed to have been Ticonderoga, was renamed Hancock. So th there was a name swap for CB-14 and CB-19 that's not to do with war losses, but you can see where most of the rest of them are. So whilst, yes, the US in 1940 and 41 has committed itself to nine additional battleships, it's committed itself to 11 additional fleet carriers, plus the arguments over the light fleet carriers, plus the committing itself to the various escort carriers, at least the early wet waves thereof. Now, of course, more would be ordered, and indeed Bennington and Boxer were ordered in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor. But given that Prior to all of this, the US Navy had had a fleet of 15 battleships and prior to Hornet, which we haven't even mentioned, had, well, the Yorktowns, three ships, the Lexingtons, two ships, so five full fleet carriers plus two sort of, then even if we ignore Hornet completely from that initial count and from the order of Essex's, you're talking about a Navy that's more than tripling its numbers of fleet aircraft carriers in the run-up to what will turn out to be Pearl Harbor. Whilst when you look at the battleships, yes, they are ordering a fair number of battleships, but one proportional to the number of battleships they've already got, and ones they're already building like the South Dakotas, the North Carolinas, and depending on how you want to count things, the first two Iowas, it's nowhere near as much proportionally and also bear in mind that before war breaks out, the US is also looking at scrapping 10 of its older battleships and only really holding over the other five. So they're looking at essentially a replacement set for their battleships before Pearl Harbor says, OK, we're actually going to keep all the old ones as well as build new ones. Whereas there's no real suggestion that they're going to scrap Lexington and Saratoga whilst they're building 
you know, over 10 Essex class hulls. That's not the mark of a Navy that only commits to aircraft carriers in a big way after Pearl Harbor now, is it? Now, as for the idea that battleships had been made obsolete on December the 8th, 1941, again, this is not really true. Battleships had been shown to be vulnerable, but to be honest, the idea of battleships at anchor being vulnerable to incoming torpedo bombers was not a new one. That fundamental idea was in the process of being exploited by the Royal Navy in 1918, when the war came to an end in World War I. Battleships at sea, well, that's a different matter, although Force Z um, immediately thereafter kind of put a little bit of a kibosh on that as well. However, you know, I've done a whole video on the loss of Force Z and why that occurred. But the simple fact is that in a post Pearl Harbor environment, there were still significant hurdles for aircraft that were trying to deal with battleships, namely, you know, if battleships, let's say, anti-aircraft guns are actually working properly, and B, battleships have sufficient escort, they were still incredibly difficult for aircraft to sink in anything like vaguely proportionate numbers. Obviously, you could just throw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of aircraft at once at a battleship, but you could throw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of anything armed with torpedoes at a battleship and you'd probably overwhelm it. There would continue to be regular heavy attacks on battleships by aircraft in a post-December 1941 environment, and they didn't accomplish a huge amount in most cases, at least until the latter stages of the war, and at that point aircraft attacks succeeding against battleships were mostly very one-sided, with a few notable exceptions. As in, it was one side doing the attacking and the other side doing all the losing of capital units. But even in a more proximate situation, battleships still had a lot to offer. Partly because if the other side has capital units, whether they be battleships, fast battleships, or battle cruisers, there are still a bunch of inherent vulnerabilities and uses. So a battleship or two escorting an aircraft carrier turned out to be a very good anti-aircraft platform because it was nice and stable, relatively long range take a few hits itself, proved an excellent distraction on occasion, and could incorporate an awful lot of anti-aircraft firepower compared to anything else. Now, granted, you could get a lot of destroyers or and a fair number of cruisers for the price of a battleship, but in terms of concentration of anti-aircraft firepower, especially stable anti-aircraft firepower, it's pretty hard to beat a kitted-out battleship in the mid-part of the war, and aircraft carriers are a lot more vulnerable to, ironically enough, aircraft carrier attack than battleships were. So that's a role for a battleship, even if it is not necessarily a fully frontline role. But in terms of the more frontline roles, battleships were still useful against other battleships in areas where you couldn't get aircraft carriers because you didn't have enough of them, like, say, Atlantic convoy runs as escorts. But in a very, very frontline role, battleships had a massive capability, especially in the Pacific, for the good portion of the war, which was they could operate at night with Japanese night fighting technology on the one hand, American radar on the other hand. Battleships could go out and knock seven bells out of almost anything else at, on the high seas in the hours of darkness and in hours of exceptionally poor weather where aircraft carriers and their aircraft just could not operate. So this is why the Japanese were sending their ships down towards Guadalcanal, for instance, at night, because the big American carrier forces that were lurking offshore couldn't go after them at night. And whilst, yes, Admiral Callahan's cruisers and destroyers did manage to dissuade Hiei and Kirishima from going after Guadalcanal in a night action, it rather ran the U.S. a bit short of cruisers and destroyers in the theater after everything had calmed down, and whilst the Japanese did eventually lose Hiei, Kirishima came back the next night. Conversely, with a little bit of help as a piñata for the Japanese, Admiral Lee, with South Dakota, the aforementioned piñata, and Washington, both of whom were battleships, put a definite end to Japanese attempts to bombard Guadalcanal at night because Kirishima can't come back and try for a third night in a row 
if Washington's put so many 16-inch rounds into her that she goes down. So until carriers attained an all-weather search and attack capability, there were huge sections of daily operational times where battleships could rule and aircraft carriers could just hope the battleships weren't quick enough to find them. And then you've got shore bombardment fire support where battleships are at much less risk uh, than aircraft carriers It's much and it's much cheaper. Now, that's not to say the aircraft carrier themselves is at risk necessarily when conducting shore bombardment operations, although, of course, if the enemy has aircraft of their own, that could be a problem. But an aircraft carrier sending aircraft out there, well, the enemy has anti-aircraft guns and you will gradually through both enemy fire and general accidents and attrition, lose aircraft. Battleships, on the other hand, can sit happily offshore, and as long as their fuel and ammunition lasts, there's very little that most shore bombardment targets can do to stop them. You can occasionally damage them with small-caliber gunfire, but the record of large-caliber shore fortifications against battleships in World War II is not great. And the small caliber stuff doesn't really threaten a battleship's existence. So there's another role for battleships there, helping you retake territory. And you could argue, of course, that you just get loads of cruisers and destroyers instead to run your aircraft carrier escort, uh, just you know, throw bodies at the enemy capital ships to slow them down until the daylight can get the carriers to go after them, etc. and so forth. And that's all well and good, except for the fact if the enemy also throws a bunch of light to medium ships at your carrier forces, bear in mind destroyers and cruisers are usually as fast or faster than most carriers, although some carriers are pretty nippy themselves, there's not a huge amount that aircraft can do to stop them, especially if they approach at night. You will knock off some, but you know a swarm attack by destroyers and cruisers against a carrier group, assuming they've got close enough in the first place, and you know, quite often it was proved you could get disturbingly close, would either drive you off station, which is a technical win, or outright sink you, which is a tactical as well as a strategic win. Battleships, on the other hand, are very, very good counters against a bunch of small gun-armed warships and medium gun-armed warships. They tend to make quite a mess of them. So that's just a few ways in which battleships still had a very active role after December 8th, 1941. Of course, they were vulnerable, but they had been vulnerable to a torpedo-carrying craft ever since the invention of the torpedo boat. So the fact they needed escort wasn't exactly new. And whilst the aircraft carrier would gradually overhaul the battleship in its overall utility, this was a factor of aircraft becoming more effective, weapons becoming more effective, aircraft being able to operate in all weathers, and a whole slew of other issues which were admittedly mostly entirely or at least partially resolved during the course of the Second World War and the few that were left were tended to be resolved shortly thereafter but they were still issues that needed resolving in December 1941 and so during the Second World War there were still plenty of things for a battleship to do. Next up we're going to look at what ships actually looked like at the various ranges that would be employed in the Second World War. Now, there's a few ways of looking at this without, you know, actually going out and finding a warship at sea. But the ranges that warships fought at were obviously very long, even in World War One. And in movies, sometimes you get the impression that this target is this big hulking thing right there. And, the, you know, looking through binoculars, you can see men running around on the deck. And it's just not true. Okay, in very specific circumstances, like, say, the final fight of Bismarck, where Rodney and King George V get right up close, then yes, that is possible. But for more prosaic battles, which are actually fought at a reasonable enough range, there's a few ways to look at it. Here, for example, are three miniatures, which all represent German World War I battlecruisers, so fairly hefty ships. The camera is positioned at one end of this hallway, and the little smudge that you might, if you're watching on a large enough screen, be able to see about two-thirds of the way up, that is the first vessel, and that is positioned at approximately a yard from the camera. 
The miniature is at 1 to 6,000 scale, so you're looking at the equivalent of 6,000 yards. So that's what a battle cruiser looks like at what in naval terms is essentially point blank range. And then the next one is two yards, so that's 12,000 yards. And then just below the door, you might just be able to see a tiny little smudge, and that's a Deflinger class battle cruiser at 18,000 yards. Now, of course, the camera is on a tripod, so it's set quite high up. So this isn't really strictly what you would see at eye level, if you like. This is perhaps what you would see from an aircraft flying about five, 6,000 feet above the ground at those ranges. So what about if you're looking at a little bit more on the level. Well, for a realistic idea of what that looks like, plus a realistic idea of what visibility can look like, I went out to a point where you can actually look out over London. And this is what we can see. So why are we looking at a fairly nondescript skyline? Well, this is in fact the London skyline as seen from Epsom Downs on normal zoom settings. And well, can't make out too much of anything. But if I take careful aim and I start to zoom in, hopefully just to the right of these trees in the foreground, you'll begin to distinguish, as we go into really big zoom, this tower block. Now this tower block is known as Tolworth Tower and is in the town of Tolworth. And well, now it looks relatively large. You can see it's actually sat kind of on a somewhat larger complex, that sort of white and beige bit underneath. Now, that white and beige bit I actually checked is about the length of a medium to large size destroyer, a Fletcher, a Tribal or something. Now, Tolworth Tower is about five miles away from us. Apologies if there's any wind noise, there's not a lot I can do about the elements. And bearing in mind the visibility today, it's not brilliant but it's not atypical for what you might find in the Atlantic or the North Sea on a, an average day. So bearing in mind that that's five miles away, so you're talking about, as we said, a destroyer, and obviously the tower itself is substantially larger in height, and at five miles you're talking around 8,000 to 9,000 yards, at around five miles, so we're talking about point blank range for World War One and World War Two capital ships. So when Duke of York, for example, engaged Scharnhorst at the Battle of the North Cape, those initial salvos, which are essentially held to have been at almost point blank range for battleships, are half again further away. So if I come back out again to the standard level of vision that matches up with what I can see through my own eyes, That is a destroyer at point blank range. Now we're going to zoom back in again and we're going to go a little bit to the right because you will have noticed this ridge with some tower blocks in front of it. Now that ridge, just pan across, that is part of Richmond Park. That is about on average, because it's obviously quite a large thing, about 10 miles away. And those uh, tower blocks, as you can see, are accommodation right on the edge of Richmond Park. Now that, those particular blocks I pre-measured are about 17 to 18,000 yards away. So you're talking about long-ish engagement ranges at something like the Battle of Jutland, typical engagement ranges for World War II. You know, some engagements open a bit further than that, some engagements open a bit closer than that in terms of overall range for capital ship engagements. Now, the distance between the two middle blocks there is about the distance that you would have covered by a large heavy cruiser or a small to medium sized battleship and Iowa or something like that or Hood would stretch a bit further but that distance between the two towers is about what you'd have for a largish for a large vessel but not a really really large one and then once again if we zoom all the way out to what I can see with my own eyes <laughs> yeah 
And bearing in mind, obviously, the camera's field of view is much narrower. I can see a considerably wider portion of the London skyline. And then for our last example, at a more extreme range, we're going to pan around to here. And we're going to start our zoom. And now we're looking more into central London. All right, and we are now at the limits of our zoom, and indeed the weather probably. And that little tower with the red lights you can see in the distance over there, that's BT Tower in central London. And once again, approximately speaking, the distance between the little tower block you can see to the left of the BT Tower and the BT Tower, and just a little bit further to the right, that's the kind of distance that you'd be looking at for a particularly large target. So a treaty battleship, Yamato, Iowa, would essentially fit if the bow was somewhere where that tower block is, the stern would be somewhere, and maybe about a third, a third that distance to the right of the BT Tower. And now, that distance is about 30,000 yards, give or take a little bit. It's a little bit hard to calculate. And... Yeah. It's a long old way off, isn't it? You can just see, see the uh, come back round. And you can hopefully see Tolworth Tower just there on the left. So just matching that up with what my eyes can see on screen and on eyes. Now try and make out where exactly the BT Tower is in your field of view now. You can see it's pretty much actually lost to view in the haze. And that's something that's A, on the horizon, and B, it's lit up. <laughs> it's not painted for camouflage or anything like that. So that gives you some idea at real ranges what you're actually going to be seeing if you're lucky looking through the scopes of battleships. So yeah, these targets are really, really tiny. So now you have an idea just how difficult it was to even spot targets, let alone actually hit them, we're going to go on to an action that was fought at somewhat closer range. Glowworm versus Hippa. Uh, one of the higher voted questions was, was there any possible way for Glowworm to ram or defeat Admiral Hippa in her you know, 1v1 action? And the answer to this one is actually quite quick and simple. Yes, it was entirely possible for Glowworm to have defeated Admiral Hippa and or sunk her by ramming. There was one very definitive opportunity. So Glowworm had two sets of torpedo launchers. She fired one set of torpedoes at under a thousand yards at Hippa. However, thanks to Hippa's captain knowing what he was doing, he kept the bow facing Glowworm, which meant she presented a very narrow target and thus the torpedoes missed. However, if you know Glowworm's aim had been very, very slightly different one way or the other, you might have ended up with a torpedo coming straight down Hippa's throat, and, well, the torpedo that smashes into the bow of the Hippa and blows a massive great hole in it, or potentially blows it clean off in the kind of weather that was experienced during that battle, probably would have done in for Hippa, especially because it would have crippled the ship, which would have allowed glowworm to continue to do what she historically did which was to duck back into her smoke screen and then historically speaking she was trying to get the second torpedo launcher working after some damage that had been incurred earlier in the fight when hippa comes through the smoke screen and finishes her off now if that damage hadn't occurred to glowworm's second torpedo launcher or she'd got it working again perhaps you know if she'd had hit with a torpedo from the first salvo that slowed hippa down then especially if Hippa is slowed down and crippled from a first hit, and or potentially even if it's just working when Hippa pops through that smoke screen, a second salvo of torpedoes could either have finished her off or done enough damage to put her down if the first set had missed completely. And then finally, when it comes to the ram, the ram in theory could have done enough damage to cause Hippa to sink. There are a few points along the side of an Admiral Hippa class cruiser where even if you ram it with a much smaller combatant like a glowworm, you will probably cause enough damage to sink the ship. Now, of course, you do want to be going as fast as possible and you want to be impacting as perpendicular as possible. And 
if at all possible, you want to be impacting roughly amidships. And although obviously you can't necessarily aim for this, but the ideal impact point would be at the junction of two bulkheads between two of the major machinery spaces, because that will induce massive amounts of flooding and cause a massive loss of power, which will probably do enough damage to sink the ship. Historically, when Glowworm hit Hipper, she wasn't traveling at full speed, but also it was not your kind of perpendicular ram, as you might imagine, but it was a kind of a glancing hit. You can look at the damage caused to Hipper by the ram, and you can see that essentially Glowworm has rammed her at a reasonable angle and in the middle of crumpling has kind of scraped along Hipper's side. So historically, Hipper faced three separate scenarios where she could have either lost that fight in the first two scenarios or it could have been a score draw because Glowworm would have gone down with Hipper if the strike with the ram had been a bit more perpendicular and a bit faster. So yeah, it's entirely possible for that to happen, but of course historically it didn't, and it would have required a significantly high rolls of the dice on behalf of Glowworm to pull it off, because as we said, Hipper's captain was no fool, and he dodged one set of torpedoes. There's nothing to suggest he couldn't have at least made a good attempt to dodge a second set. You never know where that second set would have ended up. And lastly, we have something that I've discussed, I believe, in a dry dock previously, but we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. And that is the question, if you are too close to a sinking ship, will the suction of the ship sinking drag you down? And this is something that generates a fair bit of debate online in some places. For the historian, it seems a little absurd because there are multiple accounts across multiple navies and multiple wars where ships have sunk and people have been sucked down with the ship. And most of them haven't made it, but some of them have, and they've reported what they experienced. So it seems a little bit absurd that people will question it, but people do. And the reasons for questioning it seem to mostly fall into one of two camps. Firstly, there's people that suggest that the quote-unquote suction effect is something different, like, say, massed air escape from the ship as it sinks, perhaps causing aeration of the water, which reduces its density, which means you will basically sink through it. And this, they say, is the equivalent that will cause suction or something that people would call suction that will drag people down. Now... Yes, in theory, this can happen. Heavily aerated water will make you sink. So I'm not dismissing that entirely as something that can happen when ships sink. However, to suggest that it's the only thing that happens when ships sink is, I think, entirely incorrect, and we will see why in a minute. The other one tends to come from a Mythbusters experiment where they took a small motor yacht out and sank it at a relatively slow rate. I mean, it's not the slowest sinking ever, but it's certainly not the fastest either. And they had, I believe, Adam Savage sitting in the water in a you know, full uh, life preserver, waterproof, etc., etc. And uh, shockingly, if you go and watch the Tested channel, where he now essentially spends most of his time online, he did not get sucked down and drown. Uh, spoiler alert there. And people go, oh, well, you know, this clearly proves that suction is not a thing. Well, I'm going to explain the physics of it, and also that will explain why that particular test didn't really work. Now, we're going to start with some fairly crude visualizations, and don't worry, it does get better. So here we have a cross-section profile of our arbitrary, arbitrary ship. She is four units wide and three units high, and you can see there's the water line. Now, now, if the ship sinks, then obviously all 12 units of this cross-section will be underwater. And if we say that this, unit, this ship is arbitrarily 10 units long, so we have 12 units in the cross-section, we have 10 cross-sections, assuming we're looking at a, you know, a barge-type scenario rather than an actual pointy-ended ship. So we have 120 units that are going down underwater. Now, we don't need to worry about the overall volume for the minute. We'll come back to that, though, a bit later. 
Now, at this stage, the ship has sunk to the point where it is fully immersed in the water. Okay, great. So it, it's displacing its full 120 unit volume. But as it continues to sink, using, again, a very crude approximation, what you're left with is an area that, or a volume more accurately, that the ship was occupying, which it now isn't occupying because it has moved further downwards. Now, of course, in reality, you're not going to have this void above the ship just open up like that. It's very quickly going to be overflowed with water. But this is where the suction begins, because water has to come from somewhere. So in this case, it's coming in from the sides. Now, obviously, on the full ship, it will be coming in bound stern. But let's say we're looking at a midship section. It's effectively coming in from the sides. And as the ship continues to sink, more water comes in to replace the volume that the ship is no longer occupying higher in the water column. And the water column is going down with the ship. And this creates suction, pretty much the same way as, you know, if you'd opened a drain at the bottom of a body of water, there's water going down. It forms a column of suction going down. Things get sucked down into it. Now, of course, these diagrams are incredibly crude, as I mentioned, um, just using squares. They're not 3D. And of course, as that column goes further and further down, you're going to get water coming in from the sides of that column, not just from the top. So the suction effect is going to be strongest in the immediate aftermath of the ship going down, and it will get weaker and weaker on the surface the further the ship goes down. So that means if a ship has sunk, and let's say it's gone arbitrarily half a mile down, there's not going to be a huge amount of suction on the surface. Whereas if you're in the water in and around the ship as the ship goes down, you're almost certainly, assuming it's a large ship and it's sinking relatively quickly, going to go down with it because all that water is going down. You're in the water, therefore you go with it. And obviously because the water initially is coming in more from the sides than vertical, if you're say 50 yards away from the ship when it goes down, you can get sucked inwards and then downwards. The physics are fairly simple and easy to understand. Now, why didn't the Mythbusters one work? Well, this is where it comes back to volume. And our good old friend we haven't heard from in a little while, the square cube law. If you have a relatively small vessel, one that you know isn't going to displace a huge amount, then as it sinks, that amount of displacement in additional water is going to be pulled down over the square meterage that the vessel occupied, if you look down from above. And the human barely occupies, let's say, a quarter of a square meter, so 50 by 50 centimeter section, if we're being really generous. So if the vessel weighs 20 tons and is, say, 10 meters long by 3 meters wide, so that's 30 square meters, that means that a 20 ton displacement over 30 square meters. So that's two thirds of a ton per square meter. And then you have to divide that by four because you're only occupying one section of that. So that would then generate in theory about 160 kilos of downward force. And of course that's water flowing past you as well as, you know, dropping out beneath you. So not, you're not going to feel all of that suction and you have buoyancy, which works against that. And suddenly the amount of force that you actually end up needing to resist once the buoyancy and the suction is cancelled out is not that much. You might think there's a little bit of suction at that point, but then you run into a small problem. You see, our example assumed that a 10 meter by 3 meter vessel would displace about 20 tons. But if you look at the typical vessel that actually measures about 10 by 3 meters, so, for example, a small motor launch, you're looking at a total displacement of actually more like six or seven tons. So maybe a third of what we just mentioned. So even if you were doing an absolute worst case scenario, but using our previous 150, 160 kilos, you're talking about 50 to 60 kilos of downforce and 50 to 60 kilos of downforce. And that's just in the first meter. And obviously the further it goes down, the less that downforce will become because obviously, you know, the, the water's coming in from the sides as well as from above in terms of the water column. 
you're suddenly looking at maybe 40 to 50 kilos of downforce initially counteracted by your own buoyancy counteracted by any life preserver you might have on your own swimming and of course all the losses due, due to friction and the fact that even in that first meter you're going to have water more flowing in from the side than than dropping down and suddenly it becomes very understandable why a very small vessel you're going to have minimal to no suction that you can sense and that is assuming that the vessel's dropping by a meter per second. Now, of course, as it gets further and further down, it will accelerate, but a meter per second straight off the bat is actually pretty quick. But this is where the square cube law comes in, because whilst surface area increases as a square of the linear dimension increase, volume, of course, increases by a cube, and volume is what dictates displacement. So if we take our realistic 10 meter by 3 meter vessel with, let's say, a 6 ton displacement, if you look at, let's say, a ship that's famous for having sucked down most of its crew, HMS Hood. Now, assuming that Hood was just a perfect rectangle, which is actually being really, really negative for my argument, because, of course, Hood isn't her surface area. Looking down from above would be considerably less because she's a ship, so she's got pointy thin ends. And therefore, the concentration of displacement would actually be higher. But even assuming that she is purely a rectangle as described by her length and beam that works out at just under 8,400 square meters so you're looking at an approximately 280 times increase in surface area but you're looking at an increase in displacement to the order of 7,750 times the displacement and all of a sudden that means that even in this incredibly generous situation you're looking at about five and a half tons per square meter of suction. Now, okay, you have to, as we said before, reduce that by to one quarter because you're only occupying a certain amount of volume, but you're still looking at just under 1.4 tons of suction in the surface area that you would occupy if you were mostly vertical in a life jacket above hood as she began to go down. Now, of course, again, there are going to be now relatively minor losses to your own buoyancy and the fact that, you know, water is a liquid, it's going to flow past you as well as take you with it. You know, when you get knocked off your feet by a fast flowing stream, you're not immediately moving at the same rate as the stream. It does take a little bit of time, albeit not too much, to pick you up and get you moving at close to its own stream speed. But as I said, we're using an incredibly generous idea of Hood as a perfect rectangle. If you actually work out her total surface area, that amount of suction force is going to go up even more. And at that level of force, you're going down pretty darn quickly. And as I said, you have multiple examples of this. You have an example when um, Dorsetshire and Cornwall were sunk, for example, of one of the officers popping back up to the surface and suffering the bends because he'd been sucked down far enough to suffer from decompression is issues when he was freed from the water column and popped back up to the surface. And there are ways of freeing yourself from the water column. You can swim to the side where the water column will have less effect. Um, but of course, the water column is very, very turbulent. So you might not know which direction you're going. You can, as with the survivors from Hood, be blown to the surface by a large bubble, which of course will be pushing air. Uh, well, the air will be rising and it will be displacing water above it so counteracting the downwards force or you might have a similar explosion of some sort which knocks you again out of the water column and allows your natural buoyancy to take over and you might say okay well drag that's all very well in theory so you've you've talked about the theory the physics of it mythbusters perhaps have done a slightly too small scale experiment but can you actually show the effect of something like this falling in a water column well yes i can and no, I don't have to go and get a 45,000 ton battle cruiser and sink it to illustrate the point. Because whilst the amount of suction force generated scales very, very quickly with the size of ship, the actual physical laws that cause that suction are the same on almost any practicable scale. Just the actual amount of force they exert is less. So... You can replicate this in a test environment. Now, of course, you can do this with all sorts of fancy gear. I don't have lots of fancy gear, but I do have a high-speed camera, a large glass cylinder that I can fill with water, 
and a ceramic ramekin, which is going to represent our waterlogged chip, so it's going to sink, filled with food colouring. So we're going to have a look at what happens when we drop a, well, not drop, we release a ramekin full of food colouring into a column of water. Now, to get the full depth of shot, I had to obviously film it in portrait mode. We will have a look at it uh, sideways on, which is going to look a bit weird because it'll be going right to left, but it'll get you a little bit more detail as well. But this is a thousand frames per second with a little bit of clearing up of the noise. And you can just see the ramekin coming in there at the top. Now, the ramekin is almost completely full of food colouring. There is a little bit of space on the top to allow water to flow in and splash around, simulating the last bits of buoyancy, last bits of air escaping. And here it goes. Now, what you'll see first is because this is obviously a very small scale experiment, there is that displacement of water and the water pouring in from the sides, which is initially leading to a bit of an upwelling. But you can see all the food colouring is trying to go up but it's not reaching the surface. We'll look at the top of that food colouring. We'll watch it curl over and go down with the ramekin. And also look at the air bubbles that have been freed. Air is, of course, far less dense than water. It should be rising, but the air bubbles closest to the ramekin are not rising. They have to wait till the suction gets a lot less at the top. And you can see for about two or three ramekin lengths, the food colouring billowing up and then billowing back over itself. This whole column of food colouring, as you can see, is mostly being sucked down. Little bits of it are escaping, but directly above where that ramekin went in, all that clear water, that's water that's come in from the sides and is being forced down by the displacement of the ramekin and the food colouring within. And you can see even now, as we've got to a point where the ramekins disappeared, the cylinder's about three times as long as the shot could go, and the air bubbles are starting to rise, you can still see that food colouring, which is about the same density as water, still has some downward motion to it in these last few frames. So if you imagine that at a large scale, if you are a person and you're trapped in that initial surge of water as the ship goes down, or you're dragged in by that those falling in sides, you're going to be get down in what in this case is this big column of now dirty water. And now here's the view, as I say, from the side, so it's a little bit clearer. And we're going to up the frame rate to about 2,000 frames per second. So here goes our ramekin. And you can see that it's now coming in from the right. And there's that collapsing bit of water. So you can see there's that volume of water I was mentioning earlier. And in pours the water. So now the surface is, tension is being reestablished. And you can see there's that big splash, that upwelling. Now it's that upwelling for the most part that is going to create that smudge later on. And you can see these two big columns of food coming reaching for the surface there. You can just about, and look now those tips of those columns are beginning to fall back down. There's a bit of uh, water droplets that splashed out of the cylinder falling past us at the moment. But you can also see some pretty hefty air bubbles that have been formed. And as you can see, although the ramekin has now transitioned several ramekin lengths, those air bubbles are still either being dragged down, or in the case of some of those bigger ones to the right of your screen, they're about neutrally buoyant. They're now just about beginning to regain their buoyancy as the amount of suction decreases. And you can see this main column of food coloring that's streaming out of the ramekin. You can actually see that current of water as the water pours in from the sides of the water column, which is forcing the food colouring in and then down as that water column descends. And you know, now there's mostly, apart from that sort of column, which is now to your top or was actually on the left, which is that upwelling we saw at the beginning that escaped the suction of the water column. Oh, there's a beautiful few strands there being sucked down. Um, you can actually see that for the most part, again, in that top part of the column, most of the water there is water that's come in from the sides, from the clear area, and all that water that's associated with the initial sinking of the ramekin is still being pulled down with the ramekin. This is suction in a micro scale. And you can see, again, some, some of these air bubbles that have continued to form a lot, some of them rising, but the ones that are more trapped in that water column, either remaining fairly neutral or still, in fact, going down. Obviously, bearing in mind, 
that this cylinder of water is about a foot across. That ramekin is about four inches across. So some of the bubbles we're seeing are external to the water column. And you can see now the ramekin's gone way off down. I think at this point it's probably actually hit the bottom of the cylinder. So there is no further movement down from the ramekin. But the inertia that has been kicked up is such that, as you can see, this water column is still sinking, even though we're well past the worst of the effect of it. This is what would actually happen to people, because, of course, we're using the food coloring to highlight the, the currents in the water. If I filled that ramekin with water and dropped it in, you'd have exactly the same currents. You just wouldn't be able to see them. Um, in tests that they do in labs, obviously, they tend to dye the whole water a uniform color and shine incredibly powerful lights through it for the slow-mo. And then you can see the all the percolations across the whole thing because um, they use a transparent dye. I don't have that kind of setup, but there you go. And that's the terrifying thing about suction. You know, you won't see what's holding on to you, but you sure as heck will feel it right up until you either drown or reach a pressure that it's not going to matter anymore. So yes, whilst aeration from failing boilers or compartments or whatever isn't helpful, suction caused by an object displacing water, sinking through water and thus forming a downwards water column is very definitely a thing, at least if you're caught in the immediate proximity of it. And that's why when you know you listen to all these sailors who had to go through this kind of thing where their ship sank, they were always trying to get as far away from the ship as possible, because the further from the ship you go, of course, the much wider an area that the water is flowing into that void and into that column from, and thus per surface area, per unit volume, which is what the person is occupying, the less force is being exerted on them, and so the more likely they are to survive. That is going to wrap up this particular video. I hope you found that fairly useful and informative. And, well, you know, if any of you are out there who actually have access to full-scale university or research lab grade water tanks with the appropriate dyes and high-speed equipment and all the fancy lighting and everything, and you fancy replicating it for whatever reason to demonstrate things in even more detail or whatever, then obviously feel free to do so. That would be great to watch. But um, that's it for now. And see you again in another video. Questions, of course, down below. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.